You're listening to the Wired for Impact podcast. I've got a very special guest with me today. Her name is Dr. Laura Sanger. Dr. Sanger, thank you so much for being on the call today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. I've been looking forward to this call for a long time. We spoke um, several weeks ago before the new year and just the, the call that we had usually when I talk to new guests, you know, we'll touch base for 10, 15 minutes, whatever. I, I can't remember exactly how long our call lasted, but I do remember when we hung up, I think it was maybe a 45 minute uh, to an hour call. I was like, I feel like we were just getting started. I was like, man, I, I want to hear so much more of what you've studied. So to bring my audience up to speed a little bit, you are a clinical psychologist, but you also have had a very religious upbringing and an encounter with Jesus. And I find that those two worlds often don't overlap. So to have your expertise biblically, but also from a clinical psychology standpoint is very, very intriguing, very fascinating. So first and foremost, welcome to the call. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. So for my audience, if you could expand a little bit about that, about your background to help mm -hmm. give them some context of where your mind is and where your, your education and perspectives come from. Absolutely. So as you mentioned, I'm a clinical psychologist. I retired from clinical work, though, about 11 years ago. But throughout my career, I specialized in chronic mental illness, addictions, personality disorders, and adolescent treatment. You know, I'm one of those people who just absolutely loves to learn. So I've got this naturally inquisitive mind. So I'm constantly formulating questions in my head to research. And I've been involved in research since 1989, when I began working at the VA hospital in La Jolla, California. I was in the Department of Psychiatry, and we were doing research in the area of schizophrenia. And what um, was the turning point for me is I remember doing um, an interview. On, I'm on a locked unit. Uh, you know, usually when you're on a locked unit, the people are either a danger to themselves or a danger to others. And I was doing a clinical interview with someone who was um, battling schizophrenia. And I remember asking this man, are you hearing voices? And he said, yes. And I said, well, what do the voices tell you? And he said, Satan is God and to kill my neighbor. Mm. And so at that point, I realized, okay, there probably is a spiritual dynamic here to this mental illness that's going mm -hmm. on for this gentleman. And so that kind of put me on a path towards integrating my faith and the practice of psychology. So I went to Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, and that's where I got my PhD in clinical psychology and also a master's in theology. And so I've you know, I've been doing this research, been doing clinical work for a long time, and I never intended to write a book on the Federal Reserve. I mean, as a psychologist, I have no expertise in monetary policy, but I just really felt like the Lord just kept nudging me towards writing this book. And so the book is called The Roots of the Federal Reserve, and the subtitle is Tracing the Nephilim from Noah to the U.S. Dollar. And I have to tell you that my passion for research it really comes out in this book. I spent four years researching and writing it. I started it in 2016, but that was after years of some formative things that the Lord was doing in my life. So back in 2008, you know, when our economy crashed, we went through in our family, we went, went through a personal crisis and our youngest son, who was 10 months old at the time, he was experiencing kidney failure and failure to thrive. And so it was very traumatic. We nearly lost him on two different occasions. We were hospitalized for 10 days and he had an emergency surgery. And thankfully that saved his life. And then we were discharged with him on a feeding tube. And that began the long road of recovery. And I, I did okay for the first maybe two weeks, but it was setback after setback after setback. And I think the weight of the trauma and not really knowing from day to day, if I would wake up in the morning and find him dead or alive in his crib, mm -hmm. that took a toll on me. And I, I would say I fell apart for a good year and a half or so. But when I pulled back out of that, I was super curious what had happened to our economy. And so I began reading all these books. And one of the books I read was called The Creature from Jekyll Island. Mm -hmm. And that book really opened my eyes to the corruption and the deception behind the formation of the Federal Reserve. And I realized at that point in time, 
that here's this debt enslavement system that really is squeezing the lifeblood out of Americans. I knew that it was not just a physical battle. I knew it was a spiritual battle between good versus evil. So what I did in writing this book is, you know, I've been walking with Jesus since as long as I can remember four or five. And I know in looking um, through the Bible, it's meant a lot in my own life and, you know, forming me and who I am. But as I began researching all of this, I realized the Bible actually is very pertinent to what we're experiencing in the world today. And so in my research for this book, I span from the dawn of humanity to our current day, and I identify this Nephilim agenda that has defiled our monetary system and really practically every institution in our land. And so I trace it from the days of Noah to our current day. And what I do in the book is I really uncover the spiritual levels of darkness that have been operating in the shadows. Really what I want to do is awaken people to the spiritual battle we're in the midst of. Mm -hmm. Now, one of those, what I call like theaters of war, if you want to think of it that way, has been sound and music. They have been weaponized against us. And Hosea 4, 6 says, my people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. And so one of the things that I've done since I published the book in 2020 is really trying to awaken people as to the impact of this Nephilim agenda today. And one way that I do that is, you know, I think about walking in Ephesians 5.11, which says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, but rather expose them. So I'm always grateful to come on new podcasts and speak with new audiences because it gives me an opportunity to awaken people. I love that. I I would sit next to you at, at the Thanksgiving dinner party. I like <laughs> <laughs> I want to. I want to hear all of this. This is so my world. I geek out on this stuff. So I'm excited to hear more about this. Before we get into it, though, can I just ask you, what version of Bible do you pull from? Uh, have you studied any one in particular? Great question. So my go-to Bible for <clears throat> my own personal growth, the one that I pour into and have notes all throughout is a Bible I received the year I graduated from high school. And so it's it was published the year before. So 1985, and it's a new international version, NIV version study Bible. But I, I have so many different versions. In fact, just recently at Thanksgiving, my husband found in my in-laws home in their garage, a 1890 Bible. Wow. And I felt like I just found the most incredible treasure. And so I have that and I am now pouring through it because it has both the King James version and the first English revised version. Mm. And it's side by side in this massive Bible. Wow. So I love that. that. That's so interesting to me I, as I'm learning more. I mean, I've grown up as a Christian and, and so obviously the Bible has been uh, a big part of my upbringing to an extent because, you know, as I've grown and as I've matured and I've, as I've gotten more interested and certainly with things happening in the world today, I've, my interest in it has uh, increased dramatically over the last several years. But I'm, I find it fascinating that there are different versions, different interpretations, lost books. Some include certain books, some include... So it, to me, it's like, again, the more I peel back these onion layers of the deception, you start to ask those questions like, are these being intentionally hit or is this uh, intentionally misled, misinterpreted? And so anyway, I just was curious to hear sort of where your basis came from. So, all right, well, let's get into it. Let's hear more about the weaponization of the music industry. Yeah, I think a good place to start <clears throat> is just by looking at the origins of music, because this will begin to lay a foundation for our understanding of how it's been used against us. So the first uh, human musician recorded in history is Jubal, and he was the eighth generation from Adam in the bloodline of Cain. Now, Cain, for your listeners, um, he was the son of Adam and Eve. He's the one that killed Abel. So Jubal's father was Lamech, and Lamech was the first polygamist in recorded history. And Lamech operated under the same murderous spirit as Cain. And we read that in Genesis 4, verse 23 through 24, which says, 
Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zilha, listen to me, wives of Lamech, hear my words. I have killed a man for wounding me, a young man for injuring me. If Cain is avenged seven times, then Lamech 77 times. So here we see that Lamech perpetuated this generational iniquity of Cain. You know, he walked in pride, rebellion, and murder. And we don't see in scripture that this sin in the bloodline was cleansed through repentance. So that means Jubal would have been flowing in this same generational iniquity. And we see in Genesis 4.21, it says his brother's name was Jubal. He was the father of all who play the harp and the flute. Hmm. Now, one of the things that I did in my book is I look at the etymology of words, because if we look at words in their original language and the meaning that they carried, you know, the things that have gotten lost in translation, we can regain by looking at the original meaning. So in with Jubal's name, it means stream. And it comes from the Hebrew root word yabal, which means to conduct, to bring forth with pomp and to lead. Mm -hmm. And this is that the same Hebrew root word is used for the word trumpet in Hebrew. And so we see that Jubal was the inventor of musical instruments. So here through this defiled bloodline, music enters into human history. Now, thankfully, we know from scripture that music actually existed in heaven prior to that. And we see this in Lucifer's very design. It incorporated music. And I'll read a portion of Ezekiel 28. And this is speaking of Lucifer. It says, you were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, topaz, and diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. Hmm. You were the anointed cherub who covers I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. So here in this passage, if we look at one of the words for workmanship in the Hebrew, it's Melika. And I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right. I do it the best that I can, but I oftentimes get it wrong. But it means ministry. It means occupation, officer, or manner of work. So essentially, Lucifer was created with timbrels or tambourines in his very design so that he could carry out his role as music minister in heaven. So he used music as the guardian cherub. Well, he defiled himself when iniquity was found in him. He had given his heart over to pride because he became enamored with his own beauty. But thankfully, Lucifer is also not the origin of music. We see from scripture that music originated with the creator of all things. Music is part of God's being. Zephaniah 3.17 says, the Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. And I love that concept that God is singing over us. But not only that, he taught his angels how to sing so that music could be part of the very creative work in establishing the earth. And we learn this from Job 38, and this is verse four through seven. Now, this is God speaking to Job. He says, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Tell me if you understand who marked off its dimensions. Surely, you know, who stretched a measuring line across it on what were its footings set or who laid its cornerstone while the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. So in this passage, we see that the morning stars sang together. So that implies that there was some ensemble, you know, some orchestration of music among the heavenly beings. Well, this is music's original intent to birth, to bring forth creation and to create. But Lucifer introduced defilement within music. And it's been a battleground ever since in what is called the seed war or the spiritual battle that we're in. 
Can you explain who the parties are in that battle the seed, the, of the seed war? Yes. So this is one of the things that I go much deeper in my book, but essentially, you know, the Nephilim agenda was unleashed during the days of Noah. And this is the plan to defile the human genome through the propagation of the hybrid race. The origin of the Nephilim agenda is found in the seed war. And that's found in Genesis three. And I'll read verse 14 through 15. It says, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, You are cursed more than all cattle and more than every beast of the field on your belly. You shall go and you shall eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. So after the fall of Adam and Eve, you know, when they gave into temptation and ate the forbidden fruit, what God did is he declared war between the seed of Eve, which is humanity and the seed of Satan. One day Eve's seed would crush Satan. Well, this was the prophetic declaration of the coming Messiah. So Satan's strategy was to contaminate the seed of the woman by altering the genetic code of humans. Now, this is where the fallen sons of God become integral in Satan's strategy. And we read about this in Genesis 6 and also in the extra biblical text of the book of Enoch. So what the fallen sons of God did is they chose to leave their heavenly abode and they invaded the earth realm by descending on Mount Hermon. Now, for your listeners, Mount Hermon is on the border of Syria and Lebanon and its South facing slope is in Israel. So it's a very strategic place on earth. Well, I'll read Genesis six, verse two and four. It says the sons of God saw that the daughters of mankind were beautiful and they took any they chose as wives for themselves. The Nephilim were on the earth, both in those days and afterward. When the sons of God came to the daughters of mankind who bore children to them, they were the powerful men of old, the famous men. Now, again, digging into the etymology of some of these words, what we learn is that the fallen sons of God, they actually took these beautiful women, they captured them. That word took in the Hebrew is a forceful taking of them. They forced them into marriage. They sexually violated them by raping them. And what that did is that defiled their human genome because they became impregnated with a hybrid race of giants known as the Nephilim. Now at the core of this Nephilim agenda is the goal to strip us of our humanity. They hate the fact that we are created in the image of God. And so they want to defile our human genome And the the globalist agenda and the Nephilim agenda are really after the same end goal, and that's the total domination of humanity. And one of the ways that they're carrying this out is, again, by using sound and music to enslave us and to program us. So that kind of gives you a synopsis of what the Nephilim agenda and seed war is. Is there hybrids then walking around amongst us, essentially? And why are they, why are they not giant? That's a silly question, but. (laughs) Questions. No, I love it. So as I was writing this book, I, I wrote it when I call real time, which means I had no idea the twists and turns that the investigative journey would take. It really was just an act of obedience. Every day I woke up, I love a good scavenger hunt. And so I (laughs) woke up and I (laughs) (laughs) I was like, Holy Spirit, what do you have for me today? And he would lead me and guide me. Well, I had so many paradigm shifts in writing this book. So when I first began writing it, I didn't think giants existed. Now, I didn't think Nephilim were alive today. And I have a chapter, I think it's chapter 15 called Giants Among Us, where I trace the giant footprints all across the continents. I did not touch Antarctica because that would need an entire book in and of itself. But I traced the giants on every other continent. And it wasn't until I got to the Solomon Islands that I realized that there are giants alive today. And that shifted my paradigm. I have seen some alleged evidence anyway, of skeletons that are quite large. You know, you can look this up on the internet, not to say that anything on the internet is true, of course, but there certainly seems to be evidence from relatively credible sources that discuss finding these giant skeletons. I've also heard from military people that 
there have been I've spoken to certain people in the military who have not outright said so, but they basically alluded to that. Yes, there are other types of entities that they've encountered subterranean that they were not able to really explore more on. But the, uh, in my mind, I was like, oh, man, I wonder if we're talking about, you know, giants or whatever. But uh, all of this to me is is wild. But then when you, you know, truth is stranger than fiction sometimes. And if you have enough courage to just explore the possibility of it and do a little research and you start to see some actual evidence of it, it, it for me, it does start to make me wonder. I've had some experiences in my relative recent past that have changed my paradigm quite significantly. So I'm in that point right now where it's kind of like, what do I really know? I mean, I think I know, right. you know, but what do I really know? So right. uh, anyway, let's, I'm interested to hear more about it. There's a very, very clear, if anybody's paying attention with the music industry today, I mean, it's mm -hmm. hit you over the head, obvious how demonic, how satanic it's gotten. I remember watching the Super Bowl halftime show several years ago with The Weeknd was the halftime performer. And I remember at the time, you know, there was a lot of red, there was a horns, I think there was a pitchfork, whatever. And I, I remember thinking like, oh, this is weird. And there were so, some of my people in my circle of influence were like, oh, this is so obviously satanic. And I was like, eh, maybe it's just the music industry pushing the envelope there. You know, he's trying to, you know, get attention, sell more albums, et cetera. But over the last few years, it's so painfully obvious. And then to hear all these different musicians come forward and essentially say, look, I sold my soul. You know, this was a deal I made. Uh, if you look at Bob Dylan or Billie Eilish, The, the Weeknd, um, the, Sam Smith, the list goes on and on of all of these performers. And it's so sad to see because you see these beautiful, young, incredibly talented performers and you see a before and after. And it's like, oh, man, there's certainly something influencing them to a darker place for sure. We've also heard about witchcraft and concerts. Taylor Swift, people going to concerts and then afterwards not remembering the concert at all. We've seen some other weird stuff happening with waves of energy supposedly going through these concerts. So anyway, if you could expand a little bit on the sound frequencies and how that uh, changes the DNA, I I'm fascinated to hear more about that. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I mean, you're definitely picking up on what's been going on. And it's actually, you know, sound and music frequencies have been used to steer the masses for about a century now. So um, back in the 1930s, the Rothschild Rockefeller Alliance, they began funding scientific studies examining how musical frequencies can prepare the masses for war. So in 1938, there was a theatrical designer and sound engineer. His name was Harold Burris Meyer. And what he did is he began developing sound processing techniques that would control the emotional response of audiences and create mass hysteria. And Dr. Leonard Horowitz, he writes in the book of 528, it's called the Prosperity Key of Love. He says, the Rockefeller Foundation archives showed their research is focused on psychotronic warfare, physiological stress induction, negative affective emotional arousal, mass persuasion, herd behavior, and population control. People's bodies would bioenergetically entrain to the musical frequencies and electronically engineered sound effects that would be most emotionally charged, causing people to act in certain programmable ways. So it's no coincidence that as this Rothschild Rockefeller Alliance was figuring out ways to use sound technology to steer the masses, that the international standard tuning of A was changed to 440 Hertz. So let me go into that a little bit more because yeah. this is huge. In 1939, again, the Rockefeller Rothschild Alliance, what they did is they funded Joseph Goebbels, the Nazi propagandist. Now, at the same time, the Rockefellers were aligned with IG Farben, which is the German chemical and pharmaceutical giant. Well, together, they funded the military buildup of Hitler's regime. Mm 
So at the same time, you have Joseph Goebbels with Radio Berlin organizing a conference in London to change the standard tuning of A. Now, prior to that point in time, the standard tuning of A was set to 435 hertz, and that was um, done at a conference in Vienna in 1889. But then, like I mentioned, Goebbels, he wanted to change the standard tuning of A to 440 hertz. So what Radio Berlin did is they got a hold of the British Standard Association, and they asked them to organize a conference to change the standard tuning of A. And this meeting really was a setup, you know, in which the powers that be had control of the outcome. So what they did is they didn't invite any of the French musicians um, who were mostly opposed to sh the shift to 440 hertz. And then the organizers of the conference, they interviewed ahead of time, the physicists, the instrument makers, the musicians, and the engineers. And those that were opposed to 440 Hertz, they didn't invite to the conference. So it's no wonder that a result of the conference is the standard tuning of A was changed to 440 Hertz. Now, this happened June, 1939 just months before World War II broke out. And that's no coincidence because 440 Hertz is a destructive frequency. What it does is it retrains our thoughts towards disruption, disharmony, and disunity. And it can stimulate our brain to have this disharmonious resonance. And that eventually can lead to disease and war. And let me give you a couple of examples of the destructive nature of 440. So these are research studies published more recently. So in 2021, published in the Journal of Ecological Engineering, what researchers did is they looked at the effects of sublethal and lethal high frequency sound exposure on water fleas. So they measured the impact of 432 hertz and 440 hertz on fertility and heart rate. And what they found is that the water fleas exposed to 440 hertz developed infertility and had a dramatic decrease in heart rate. But even more alarming was that within weeks of that study, all the water fleas exposed to 440 hertz died. Mm. Then another study also published in 2021, this one was with humans, and this was published in the International Journal of Human Sciences. What they did is they had people listen to music tuned to 432 and 440 hertz, and then they measured their mood. And what they found is that people reported an increase in negative mood after listening to 440 hertz. And that finding was particularly pronounced within men. So now if we take a step back and we kind of look at the big picture, remember I talked about the Nephilim agenda. The goal is um, total domination of humanity. Well, one way to do that is you need to have a depopulation plan. Well, how do you depopulate? You create infertility and you lead to war. Well, 440 Hertz does both of these things. And so Leonard Horowitz, he makes an interesting conclusion. He says, the intensive research into the military and commercial value of compelling herd behavior with music to induce stress, promote diseases and suppress spirituality has enabled the world's wealthiest people to exercise cultural control through programming. Mm. So not only have we been programmed by these harmful frequencies, but the frequencies that can actually benefit us physically, emotionally, and spiritually, those have been suppressed. But thankfully, more and more people are awakening to the beauty of tuning A to 444 hertz. In fact, Dr. Horowitz talks about, you know, when you shift your instrument, tuning it to 444, what happens is not only um, is it acoustically more pleasing, it actually stimulates us kinesthetically and it, it can revitalize us spiritually. Also, scientists use that frequency to repair DNA. So when you tune an instrument to 444 hertz, and this is much easier with stringed instruments, piano, keyboards. The wind instruments and the brass, it's very difficult. You have to remake the instruments. Mm -hmm. But when you do tune your instruments to 444, four of the solfeggio tones come forth. So G is 396 hertz. 
G sharp is 417 hertz. And then C, middle C is 528. And E flat is 639. So then why is that important? Well, the solfeggio frequencies are known to have some healing properties. And I'll, I'll talk specifically about 528 hertz. It's actually known as the miracle tone. And this is the frequency that scientists use to repair DNA. Also, when God spoke creation into existence, that 528 hertz was key to sustaining life. You know, you think about um, the sun, the sun's frequency actually vibrates at 528 hertz. And so chlorophyll, which is this optimal energy transducer, it absorbs the sun's frequencies and then converts that into oxygen for every cell in our body. Well, that oxygen vibrates at 528 Hertz. Mm. So you can see how it's this life giving frequency, but what the enemy has done is he has suppressed this information because music and sound is so vital to his battle strategy. And really music and sound have been weaponized to mutate our DNA. And as I mentioned, the Nephilim agenda, the goal is to defile our human genome. And one way they're doing that is through these advancements in biotechnology. Mm. Yeah, that's a whole another rabbit hole with the recent pandemics and the so-called mm -hmm. solutions that they came up with for that. We're not going to say any buzzwords, but I want to ask you a quick technical question that I don't know if you have the expertise in it or not, but when you change the Hertz, are, are you changing the actual tone of that key? Yes, I believe so. Now I am not a musician. That's what, yeah, I wasn't sure um, if that was. But I have children that are, and I have many friends that are musicians. And so what's interesting, so let's say you play guitar, I see a guitar in your, in your room there. Mm -hmm. If you want to tune that, you know, you pick up your digital tuner. Well, Everything is set to 440 hertz because it's the international standard tuning. All music is played in that, virtually all music. So if you want to change it, you just go into the settings on your tuning app device app mm -hmm. and you just set it to 444 hertz. And then you go about tuning your guitar and it will then tune to that new frequency. And yes, the tone is slightly different and it makes a difference. And I can go into a little bit more, but it's just, it's beautiful because it brings forth not only healing to our physical body, but spiritually it awakens us as well. Yeah. I've been in another community. I, I don't know if you know the name, Dr. Joe Dispenza. Does that name? Yes. It? Okay. Mm -hmm. So I've been in that community for a little bit too. And he is a scientist and he talks very scientifically about frequency and vibration and sound and how we're electromagnetic beings. If you go down to the quantum level, we are essentially collapsed energy. There is no real material substance. Even an atom is, you know, 99.99999% space and just energy. And so when you start to, again, peel the onion layers back of our true nature, and we find that we are essentially these energetic beings, does it not make sense that these sound waves that our body is picking up is directly affecting us? We all know when you hear certain music, how it affects your mood, how it affects your emotions. The Jurassic Park example, when you see the sound frequency hit water and it vibrates, and we are made essentially up of water, but again, even at a more molecular level, just space and energy. Because when you first start to hear this stuff, it sounds maybe out there or it's a stretch order, but when you really start to examine it, there, there really is no debating the fact that sound vibrations affect us. I mean, what is language if not vocal cords and sound vibration? Right, right. That, it, it's, that is what we all are. So it does make sense. I'd be interested to have you put your clinical psychologist hat on for a second. There's a theory that uh, rap specifically has been designed to denigrate a certain black culture. And then of course, other cultures that tap into that as well. The music can be very, I mean, I listen to rap. I've, I've, there's a lot of rap that it's very intriguing. Like, yeah, you almost, if, from a spiritual sense, you have to like, the part of me that's like, man, I, I wish the devil wasn't making such good music. This is just, it sounds, it's, you know, there's a, there's a seduction to it. There really is. And if you notice like where your behavior goes, when you, you're not only interacting with the musical frequency, but you're also getting the lyrics. 
and the suggestive nature of all of that, it's very, very influential. So anyway, I'm curious how that type of music can actually go about affecting somebody's behavior. Can you walk us through maybe the the steps Absolutely. of how that happens? Yeah, I love that question because it it ties in so much of what I've been researching. You know, it ties in again the the emotional reaction that you have to music. It ties in epigenetics, which I'll talk about in a minute. It ties in mind control programming that happens and really the spiritual battle that we're in the midst of. So maybe to, to answer that question, I think what's important to understand is how over time this has been developed, how music has been really orchestrated in such a way that it would be weaponized against us. Again, going back to what I talked about in the beginning, that Nephilim agenda is really to mutate us to defile our DNA. Well, that seems like, it seems like a crazy concept that music could do that. So let me walk us through this a little bit. That'd be great. Before I do though, I have to give credit where credit is due because I have a dear friend, his name is Mitchell Florin, and he is easily the most brilliant person I've ever encountered. He's a biopharmaceutical microbiologist. Wow. And he was... (laughs) Right. And he was a whistleblower on big pharma. As a result of doing that, he lost his marriage, his health, his career, and his financial portfolio. But why did he, why did he lose his marriage? If you don't mind me asking, they went after her big pharma stressed out the marriage. Wow. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. So he, paid a high price for standing in integrity. And the reason I say that is because he is the one that provides me with all sorts of research. He's like a personal professor for me. (laughs) And he was an atheist for years and years and had this radical encounter with Jesus. I think it was about 14 years ago. And he's been walking with Jesus ever since. And I'm so grateful that the Lord connected us because we just make a really good team. He does a lot of the the research behind the scenes. And when I'm, you know, wanting to discuss a certain topic or write about it or speak about it on a podcast, I'll just send him a text. I'm like, hey, Mitchell, do you have anything on X, Y, and Z? And I get like 10 or 15 peer-reviewed studies on X, Y, and Z that I'm asking for. Amazing. So he also wants me to send his regards to you. He was thrilled that I was going to share some of his findings or some of the research that he provides me with. He hasn't done the actual research, but anyways, he sends oh, his that's, regards. That's very kind. I'd love to have him on the podcast if he's interested, if, if he wants. So, Well, thank yeah, you. We, you so, can connect us if, if he wants to do One that. of the things that I want to do to walk us through this is first review some patents. And these are patents that are really using mind control technology. Now, there's a ton of patents. I'm only highlighting a handful. And one of the things I want to say, too, before I go over these is, you know, the person who came up with this invention may have had the highest integrity. I don't want to assume anything negative or nefarious, but we know that inventions don't always stay in the hands of their inventors and that they get into the hands of people that don't have the utmost integrity. So going back to 1968, so patent number 3393279 talks about the nervous system excitation device. That's the title of this patent. And what it does is it provides a means of initiating controllable responses of neurosenses without applying pressure waves to the ears or stress waves to the ears. So in other words, it uses electromagnetic signals with a frequency above the audible range. So it's a way of communicating without our ears picking it up. So that was in 1968. In 1976, patent number 3951134. This is titled the apparatus and methods for remotely monitoring and altering brain waves. Now check this out. What this does is it uses high frequency transmitters to radiate electromagnetic energy of different frequencies through antennas, which are then capable of scanning the entire brain of a person. 
then the waveforms are sent back to the brain to affect a desired change. And all that is done remotely. In 1992, patent number 5159703, it's called Silent Subliminal Presentation System. And this is this uses audio signals that are high enough in the audio spectrum that the human ear can't pick up, but low enough that home entertainment systems can use them. And so it sends a signal through home entertainment systems that our brains pick up, but our ears cannot hear. Amazing. In 1993, there's a patent number 5213562. And this is the method of inducing mental, emotional, and physical states of consciousness, including specific mental activity in human beings. So what this does is it uses audio stimulation to replicate a desired state of consciousness, which can vary between states of alertness and sleep. And these states of consciousness can be transferred from one individual to the next. That's crazy. Well, that's crazy. Okay. Yeah. This is so like, <laughs> it, it's so wild. I'm trying to wrap my head around that piece of it and, or what the, what the actual potential nefarious application of this is. Is it to make you nauseous? Is it to uh, lay in suggestive thought in your head to, you know, be lazy or to go do something stupid or is it to literally physically control? I, I, like what is this, the tangible here's outcome my... of this? Yeah, here's where my mind goes, a potential use. I can't prove this at all. But let's say in schools, for example, they are releasing this type of frequency that can induce kind of a more sedated state in students to where they are essentially being dumbed down. So their mental activity is not as sharp, is not as able to pick up nuances that are being spoken to them. That's one possible usage of it. One more patent that I'll bring our attention to. This one was in the year 2000. And this I have, I, I know how it's being used practically. So this is uh, patent number 6017302. And it's called subliminal acoustic manipulation of nervous systems. Okay. So within humans, if sensory resonances can be excited using subliminal atmospheric acoustic pulses. So essentially a resonance of half a Hertz can affect the autonomic system and may cause relaxation and drowsiness. A resonance of two and a half Hertz can actually slow down cortical processes and create disorientation. So how this is being used is police will actually use this device in standoff situations. So that kind of gives you an idea. Now, in addition to all these patents that I've mentioned, there are advances in biotechnology that we need to be aware of in order to maintain our sovereignty as individuals. Mm -hmm. Now, most everyone these days understands what Wi-Fi is. I remember when I was in graduate school, my last year, well, second to the last year in graduate school is when the internet came out, or at least we started seeing advertisements. And I was in California and I remember it was, the advertisement was surf the web. And I was mm. like, what the heck is a web? Like, what do you mean surf a web? I'm picturing waves at the beach. How do you mm -hmm. surf that? I didn't understand what it was, but now everyone knows what Wi-Fi is. But not everyone understands what Bi-Fi is. Bi-Fi is the biological internet, and it transmits information across the DNA into cells. Now, our DNA is like this energy amplifier. It's a coil. And essentially, you know, we were created such that our DNA is like an antenna that picks up frequencies that were set in motion from the creator God. And every cell in our body has this divine intelligence. But what the Nephilim agenda has been doing is it's set out to defile the beauty of our God designed DNA. Now I'll share a couple of um, research studies that are mind blowing. So the first one um, is in 2012. This was done by the Stanford Research Institute. And what they discovered 
is they discovered how to use a virus to encode information into infected cells. So once a virus gets into cells, it then releases that information. Now, again, if we take a step back and we consider what we've been through recently, is it possible then that those who are experiencing long haul symptoms Really, that came about because the virus was encoded with information that then got into their cells and altered their DNA. So this type of research, essentially what it does is it gives scientists the ability to transmit whatever messages they want across cells. And one of the researchers on this project, she talked about how in the future, now again, this was in 2012, She's talking back then. She says in the future, this research could be used for tissue engineering and also for the creation of artificial organs. Well, that's already happening today. Now, another study, this was more than 20 years ago, and this was conducted by Russian scientists. And what they discovered is that words and frequencies can reprogram our DNA. Now, this is where epigenetics comes in, like I was talking about earlier. So Mm. simply stated for your audience, epigenetics is the impact our thoughts, behaviors, and lifestyle choices have on our body, soul, and spirit, as well as future generations. So what these Russian scientists did is they decided to examine the 90% of our DNA that Western scientists consider to be junk DNA. (laughs) See, Western scientists, they only focus focus on the 10% of our DNA that's used in developing or building protein. So the Russian scientists, they thought outside of the box and they were rewarded because their findings were groundbreaking. What they found is that the 90% of our DNA is actually involved in data storage and communication. In fact, the genetic code of that 90% of the DNA actually follows the same rules as human language. It uses syntax and grammar rules. So it appears that our human language is really just verbalizations of our DNA, which is fascinating. Yeah, geez. But even beyond that, what they did is they discovered how to use frequency and words to transmit information from one set of DNA to another. So practically speaking, they turned frog embryos into salamander embryos without a surgical procedure. Whoa. And this really is scientifically showing the power in our words. And this ties into, you know, how epigenetics can change our DNA. So one of the things that I want to um, encourage us and maybe turn a corner to talk about some good news because all of that can be <laughs> kind of disturbing, but we can actually use epigenetics to help break us free from this mind control technology that's used with music and sound. But I'll pause there because that was a lot. I just unloaded. <laughs> no, that was, I mean, again, any one of these we could probably spin off and do a whole nother hour long conversation on, but is there a way before we get into how to break free from it? Is there a way to like audit, you know, either your body or your environment to see if there's frequencies going on that are beyond your hearing or, you know what I mean? To just get some sense of where somebody is on the scale of inundation or not. Yes. And I don't, I don't remember the technical term, but you can buy, I don't know if it's EMF readers or what it is, but you can buy certain frequency monitors or readers, and it will tell you what sort of frequencies are are going through your home. I think we all would be shocked how much we are inundated with frequencies. I mean, even just 5G alone, that, like you said, that's a whole nother hour long discussion, but that gives you an idea. But the good news is, yes, there are ways um, that we can combat this. And that's one of the things that I absolutely love about walking with Jesus is because he's our living hope. It means that no matter what the Nephilim agenda throws at us, there's always a way out. There's always um, something that counteracts it. Uh, Just as a quick visual, as you were talking about the frequencies that we know that we're inundated with, um, I've been told that we are essentially in a soup of all of these different frequencies without any coherence. So the mental image that that comes up is like if you kind of imagine a swimming pool 
and you have maybe 10 people around and you have one person that, that's splashing like crazy, another person that's jumping back and forth, you can imagine sort of visually the disruption in the waves of that pool that there's no coherence, there's no, it's just all random and unsettling and uh, discombobulated, as opposed to if everybody in sync created a, a splash at the same time, they had a, like a raft or something. And so that you had a pulse of, and, and I, I've been in those states, I think when people talk about being in state or in flow, you know, or in the zone as an athlete, oh, I was in the zone. Like, what does that actually really mean? And there've been studies that have shown that what that actually means is that your body is in coherence so that your, your brain waves and your heart waves, the electromagnetic waves that your body is producing are all in sync. Dr. Joe Dispenza talks a lot about this. And when you go into a certain meditative state, it brings you were talking about divine intelligence at the cellular level. He guides you to a place where your entire body is vibrating in coherence. And he talks about wholeness. And I always thought about that in terms of uh, just this metaphorical concept, like, oh, wholeness. Well, when you feel it literally at the cellular level where your body is in harmony with everything else around it, there is a wholeness that is beyond words. I've also felt this within a religious context as I've better understood Christ consciousness. And so you contrast the two of those, you know, when you think of being in that, in the state of flow or in the zone, the level of focus, the level of impact of creation of creativity versus those days when you just feel sluggish and you don't know why, but like everything is just slogging and an effort. It's like, what's the frequency environment that you're in anyway? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Let's talk about, thoughts. yeah, let's talk about how to break free from that and, and turn this to a message of hope and inspiration. Absolutely. And that's my favorite thing to do is distribute hope. So there's a, a Spanish neuroscientist, famous one, Santiago Cajal, I think is how you pronounce it. And he said this, he says, any man could, if he were so inclined, be the sculptor of his own brain. So we're talking about, you know, how every thought and emotion has its own frequency, which means it carries this vibrational energy, just like you're talking about that can literally shape our DNA. Now, one way to think about our DNA is it's like this liquid crystalline substance that functions as an antenna or a transmitter of information. And so it's in this fluid like substance that is constantly in flux, you know, it's going through a process of transformation based on the information it's receiving, whether that's through thoughts, sight, sound, other sensory input. Now, Dr. Carolyn Leaf, she wrote a book called Switch on Your Brain. And it's probably one of my favorite books, especially Ooh, addressing uh, epigenetics. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna read um, an excerpt from her book. She says, the scientific power of our mind to change the brain is called epigenetics. And spiritually, it is as a man thinks, so is he, which is Proverbs 23, 7. The way the brain changes as a result of mental activity is scientifically called neuroplasticity. And spiritually, it is the renewing of the mind, Romans 12, 2. The science of epigenetics, which is tangible scientific proof of how important our choices are, they bring life or death blessing or cursing, and they reach beyond us to influence the next generations. This is because choices become signals that change our brain and body. So these changes are not dictated by our genes. Our thinking and subsequent choices become the signal switches for our genes. What's incredible is that genes are dormant until switched on by a signal. They have potential, but they have to be activated to release that potential. Your choices might impact the generations that follow, which is Exodus 34, seven for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation. Mm -hmm. So what she's talking about here is she's talking about the power in our words, especially in releasing blessing or curses. So we literally can cause ourselves to develop sickness or disease because we curse ourselves or because we come into an alignment with others that curse ourselves. And the Lord has really had to change my language and teach me how important it is, the words that I speak. So for example, you know, if I'm experiencing symptoms of a head cold, I used to say I'm sick. I am sick. I no longer say that 
I say, I am fighting sickness or I am overcoming sickness Mm. because I don't want to claim sickness, disease, or debilitation as part of my being. And so Mm. often, you know, I hear people say like my bad back or my arthritis or my tumor or my cancer. Well, what they're doing is they're cursing themselves with that very thing because Mm. they've claimed it as part of their being. And you mentioned earlier, you know, how our body is partly water. You know, if we think about conservatively, maybe 60 to 70% of our body is water. I've heard upwards of 80%, but conservatively, it makes sense that sound and words make such an impact on our body. You know, in fact, blessings and curses emit a certain frequency. So when a curse is spoken, it releases a dissonant sound and that alters matter even to the subatomic level. Mm-hmm. And there's some fascinating research. You may have heard of this study, but this is um, by Masaru Emoto. And he looked at um, the impact of positive words, which are blessings and negative words, which are curses on water molecules. Mm-hmm. So what he did is he wrote on strips of paper words and he taped them to a water bottle with the words facing the water. And then he examined the crystallized form of that water molecule under a microscope. And what he found is that the structure of the water molecules changed based on the messages it received. So words like love and gratitude formed these beautifully perfect water crystals. But then words like you fool or Hitler or hate formed these chaotic, ugly water crystals. Now, obviously water cannot read. But the frequencies created by the written words caused a vibration that changed the structure of the water molecule. And what this does is this shows us the power of blessings. Blessings can heal. They can bring forth beauty. It also shows us the power of curses to destroy. And if you think about, you know, how definitively these vibrations from the words impacted the water. Now imagine what lyrics in songs do to our body when we Mm -hmm. play those. But then imagine if we were to speak the word of God over us, what it does to our body. So listen to Isaiah 55, 10 through 11 says, as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater. So is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. So the word of God brings life. It brings healing and transformation. And I share all these things because I think it's really important that we are mindful about what we are exposing ourselves to through movies, through TV shows, through music, through, you know, social media and all these frequencies that we've talked about that we're living in this soup, because essentially our bodies are absorbing those things and it can change our DNA. And this is part of that Nephilim agenda, the the goal to strip us of our humanity and defile our human genome. Essentially, you know, we're programming ourselves with the information that we're allowing in. And that's why it's so important to guard our thoughts. In 2 Corinthians 10, 5, it says, we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. See, our thinking can alter our genetic expression, making us susceptible to disease and illness. But the good news is, is that there's always a way out of the dark caverns of mind control. Freedom and transformation are available because our creator designed our brains with the capacity for neuroplasticity. I think that's one of the most amazing aspects of our brain is that our brains are malleable and adaptable. And we read about this in Romans 12 too. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is his good, pleasing and perfect will. Now, again, with my naturally inquisitive mind, a couple of years ago, I'm reading this passage. I'm like, okay, Lord, what does it mean literally to renew your mind? I want to know how to do that. And again, going to the etymology of the word, this 
is in the New Testament, which was written in Greek. So you go to the Greek word for renew and it's onikonosis. And not only does it mean renew, it means renovation and it means a complete change for the better. And it comes from the root word onikono, which means to cause to grow up, to make new and to be changed into a new kind of life as opposed to the former corrupt self. Well, I love that. And I don't know about you, but I don't want to have anything to do with my former corrupt self. You know, I want to be transformed by Jesus so I can live a life that's free from the superficial values and opinions of our culture. You know, I want to live a life full of purpose. And that's what we have opportunity to do. And one way that we can renew our mind is be mindful of the music that we're listening to. Not only the lyrics, because the words affect us, but also shifting out of 440 hertz into 444 hertz. And there aren't a lot of musicians that have made that shift, but there are some. And so just practically, I'll share who those people are in case your audience wants to listen to music in 444. Yeah, definitely. Now, just last week, I discovered that Dr. Leonard Horowitz has on the internet, he has 528 radio. And so what he's done is he's transposed music from different genres into 528 Hertz. Now, again, Mm. that's the C note when you tune your instrument to 444. So there's that, but then also there are musicians who have shifted and tuned their instruments to 444. Uh, Steve Rees with Calming Harp is one. Michael Tyrell with Whole Tones. Then Phil and Angela Lamb with Mountains in the Sea. And then finally, a new up-and-coming Christian artist named Bay Turner. He's about to release his new album, and all of it is in 444 hertz. So that's just something that we can do. The other thing, I'll just end with this. You were using the analogy of just all the frequencies um, that we live in. It's like this soup, and they're all competing with each other. One of the things that I have found, in addition to changing the music I listen to, and you know, I incorporate prayer in my daily life and all that, one of the other things is linen. Linen has a frequency of 5,000 Hertz. And it's the reason why in scripture, the priests wore linen ephods or, you know, angels will appear in fine linen. It says in some Mm of um, the passages in scripture. Well, for my birthday, I ordered linen sheets, bed sheets and linen pajamas. And I have to say my birthday was in November. So it's been a couple of months, but I have noticed a difference in that I sleep better. So I don't wake up hardly at all throughout the night. The other thing is, you know, periodically I would be having back issues, like just sore muscles, that sort of thing. I noticed that when I lay down, so if I have um, a sore back throughout the day, I go to bed. Normally what would happen before the linen sheets is I would wake up and sometimes that would continue. Like it would get worse. The knot would get harder or whatever. Now I wake up. It's like, I've been reset as I sleep on the linen sheets. Um, And so one night I, you know, we're in a cold climate. And so I had on all these fleece pajamas and I slept and I woke up in the middle of the night and I was like, Oh my gosh, the, the pajama fabric I'm wearing is canceling out what the linen is trying to do. So I ordered linen pajamas and no problem ever since. In fact, what I'm wearing today is linen as well. So what linen does at that high frequency is it elevates us. It brings healing to our body because death is at a very low frequency. And so the higher the frequency in the fabric that you wear, the healthier you are and more spiritually in tune as well. You don't normally think of fabric as emitting a frequency. We normally think of frequency as like sound or maybe some type of radio frequency or whatever, but I guess everything kind of emits uh, a frequency, does it not? It does. Yeah. Yeah. Quantum physics teaches us with string theory, everything has a frequency. Do you have any other quick little hacks like that? So linen, (laughs) another one that that I was told too was grounding, stepping out on, uh, stepping on the earth with your bare feet and how that, it's like a you know, when you have electromagnetic shock and it like recalibrates stepping on the earth is my understanding that you, if we are these electromagnetic beings with neutrons Mm -hmm. and 
protons and electrons, and then you step on the earth and it, I, I, I don't know, obviously I'm very <laughs> exposing myself right now of how I just know that that I, I notice a change when I do that. So linen, anything else that comes to mind? Uh, quickly, well, but... I was going to mention grounding. I would say the most important thing that I have found is practicing what you referred to as meditation. And I, it, for me, it's time with the Lord. And so whether that's if people carve out time in the morning or in the evening, what you want to do is you want to carve out time where you're not interrupted by other things. And, you know, I have different ways that I connect with the Lord. One way is through times of silence where I don't have my Bible. I don't have my journal. I don't have my phone, nothing. I just simply come before him in silence. And what you were saying that Dr. Joe Dispenza was talking about, I experienced in my relationship with Jesus, when I come into that quiet place, man, he just, he invites me into his presence. And that's where I hear his voice more clearly. He opens up my spiritual eyes to see things that I need to see. So that is the best hack of everything is my opinion. That's a, that's a great point. And how little we often create space in our lives to have silence these days. I was just talking about this with a previous podcast guest and how I look at my kids, you know, and downtime to them is staring at their phones. And I do, I'm guilty of that too. When you and I grew up, it was downtime. Like, do you remember being bored? Do you remember saying like, mom, dad, I'm bored. And they're like, suck it up. Sorry. You know, and you just, <laughs> it's like, we actually had nothing going on. So you had to get creative or you had those moments of connection to higher, higher being, higher authority. But I do want to just state for the record here on the podcast, like I, I have explored, I, I'm an inquisitive mind too. And so I, I find truth in all things, elements of truth, I should say, but I, I continue to come back to what I would call Christ consciousness. When I go, when I meditate or when I'm praying or I, also take time to try to connect to God and the a level of authority like that I, I I've recently kind of tapped into and I've it's been sort of revealed just how expansive Christ consciousness is it, it's so humbling and so to end this episode on a note of uh, continued hope, and you've done a wonderful job of doing that, but just from my perspective, there is, it can seem overwhelming, like what we've talked about, this soup of frequencies that we're in, and we've only talked about sound frequencies. We haven't talked about nutrition and you know the chemicals that are in the sky and in our water and all this other stuff, but there is absolute authority in Christ consciousness, I have discovered, and... Uh, so anyway, this conversation is so fascinating and uh, I would love to have you back on and maybe we could go down another vertical, but thank you so much for sharing uh, all of this and for putting in the labor of figuring these out, things out and connecting all these dots. You've done a brilliant job of taking this very seemingly out there concept and bringing it down to very practical things. And you brought receipts with the patent numbers and all that, which I very much appreciate. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. Thanks for having me. One last quick question, actually, for those that are interested in finding more out about you, where can they go? Uh, the best place is my website, which is no longer enslaved.com. And then from there, I have monthly articles. If people want to sign up for those, those are free. You can purchase my book. It's available on Amazon. I also narrated it. So it's available in Audible for those that like to listen to books. A Spanish version is about to be published. I'm super oh, cool. excited about that. I also have a YouTube channel and a Rumble channel called No Longer Enslaved. And I do a 10-part series called The Impact of the Nephilim Agenda Today. And then also, if people want to follow me on social media, I am on Instagram, Laura Sanger, 444 Hertz, and then also Telegram with the same name. Love that. And can you give the title of your book one last time real quick? It's called The Roots of the Federal Reserve. Fantastic. Can I ask you one last quick question before we go? Um, you mentioned the book being in Spanish. Do different languages have, I, I'm assuming they have different frequencies. Have That's you looked into that question. at all? Uh, just barely. What I'm understanding is that there's incredible things with Hebrew, the Hebrew language itself uh -huh. that I am wanting to dig into. So I won't say anything because okay. I don't know a whole lot. 
my son is a polygot, which I didn't know what that was until he told me, but it's somebody that speaks multiple languages. And he follows this one girl on YouTube and she speaks like nine different languages. And it's fascinating to watch her go from, you know, speaking Spanish to Russian and the energetic shift. Russian, it's more masculine. There's a, there's a edge to it. There's a boldness to it. Then she goes into Italian and Spanish and it's like, there's this passion and it's like, it's so interesting to see, but anyway, we'll leave that. We'll table that for another conversation. <laughs> Dr. Laura, thank you so much for uh, sharing and uh, wow. What a fascinating conversation. Thanks for having me. Thank you for listening to this episode of Wired for Impact. If you're interested in creating and expanding your impact, be sure to visit us online at impactnow.com.